Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Conserving Pollinators on Small Scale Farms. I'm Haley Nelson, and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. I'll begin by first explaining the agenda. Dr. Donald Lewis is here with us right now. You can see him on camera. Hi, Dr. Lewis. Um, he's from Iowa State University and will begin by presenting his segment of the presentation. And then he'll be followed by Dr. Laura Jesse of Iowa State University. Uh, when their presentations are finished, we'll have a question and answer session in which you as the participants can ask questions that you have and they will be answered by our question and answer panel tonight. Uh, our Q&A panel for this webinar uh, consists of Dr. Laura Jesse and, and Dr. Donald Lewis from Iowa State University and then Dr. Rick Besson is also here with us from University of Kentucky and then also Dr. Shelby Fleischer of Penn State University. When our question and answer session is completed, I will go ahead and close the webinar. Donald and Laura, I'll go ahead and turn off my cameras and audio and you can get started. Okay, we're going to uh, go to a full screen mode here so that you can see the slides, I think. There we go, that's what we wanted to show you. And hello everybody and welcome to the OREI and the SARE. These are government programs that have funded research that we are presenting in these this series of webinars. And tonight's pro program is on conserving pollinators, especially on small scale farms. Um, I'll have the first half and then Laura and Jesse will come in to talk about preserving and protecting pollinators. And then as Haley has described, we will take your questions and answers. First, we're going to start though with the importance and the decline in the identification of pollinators, especially as it relates to cucurbits. Pollinators are incredibly important to agricultural production. We guess 20 to $30 billion a year from the, ag from the um, environmental service that pollinators provide us. And some people estimate that that's one third of all the food and beverages that we consume. Honeybees are of course the workhorses of the pollinator industry, especially where we try to manage and manipulate the pollinators. Honeybees can be confined like livestock. We can box them up, we can move them, we can put them where the pollinator numbers are low. We can accomplish what pollination we need, and then we can take those pollinators back out. Another advantage of using honeybees is that honeybee workers will, in, re, will recruit more workers from their hive to come work the crop that they are working. And finally, honeybees have something called floral constancy, where once they find a food source, they will continue to use that food source, even if there are other food sources available. So they will continue to come to the crop that we want pollinated, and that's why we like honeybees for pollinator services. But not all pollinators are honeybees, the European honeybee. Honeybees are social bees, and another pollinator that is in that category are the bumblebees. Social bees are those that have a division of labor where you have a queen that does the reproduction, you have workers that gather the food and take care of the offspring, and you have males, the drones, that wait around for a chance to mate with new queens. Another characteristic of the social bees is that there's an overlap of generation, generations and there is communal care, that is the colony is taking care of the offspring. This is in contrast to solitary bees, one of our uh, other pollinators, where each female builds a nest and each female is capable of laying eggs and she does this without the assistance, without the help of any workers. We guess there's about 4,000 species of these in the United States and if you're wondering what these look like or what these might uh, consist of, if you think of what you grew up calling sweat bees, that's the type of bee we're talking about, generally small, often brightly colored, uh, and we'll go through a few of those as we go along. Regardless of the type of bee we're talking about, uh, entomologists like to remind you of the life cycle, and in order to propagate more bees, we must go through this life cycle you see across the top of the page. Eggs are laid by the adult female. Those hatch into larvae that have to be fed or cared for, or they have to eat food that was provisioned by the female. The larva goes into a pupa stage where the individual insect digests itself, transforms itself into the adult stage. Males and females mate, and we start that cycle over. The picture shows how that would look in a solitary bee, going from an adult female laying eggs in, the, uh, in a nest in the ground, that egg hatching into a larva that develops through pupa and back to the adult stage. As we talk about cucurbits, we know pollination is incredibly important, that we need lots and lots of bee visits to accomplish pollination. Each musk melon contains up to uh, 600 or more seeds, and every seed must have a pollen grain in order to develop. And that comes, those pollen grains are brought to the flowers by lots and lots of visits by the bees that are gathering nectar and pollen for their own use, and as a side benefit to us, transferring the pollen from one flower to another and accomplishing pollination. One of the research projects that we have been involved with uh, in the three states that were mentioned earlier is to examine what bees are already out there in cucurbit fields, a little uh, information on are they pollinating the crop, and then 
do we have pollination limitation? And if we did, could we increase the amount of pollination that's out there? So those are the questions that we'll answer here um, in the next uh, few moments of our prepared um, uh, presentation. As I mentioned, three states have been involved with this, Iowa, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania, and it's been our pleasure to work with outstanding entomologists and horticulturists and plant pathologists from the other states as we accomplish research on farms and on our research farms to try to answer the questions we just mentioned. So our first question, what pollinators are present? And we've had cucurbit fields throughout those three states where we have gone out and sampled bees in a variety of methods to find who is out there and also who's doing the work of pollination that's necessary for the crop. So all three states have been conducting this research. Here's some research results from Kentucky where in a field they, that they examined for pollinators, they found 37 different species of pollinators out there. The names aren't terribly important and it's a long list of um, names that are hard to pronounce and don't mean a lot to us. Just notice the variety though, the incredible number of different species that are already out there that are already present in these fields where the research was being done. Here um, is a graph from eight different farm fields in Iowa where we collected bees by two different methods. The small black bar are bees that were collected in the flowers using that little gadget at the top, which is called a bee vac. It's a modified dust buster that sucks the bees out of the flowers as the researchers walk through and examine the flowers usually early in the morning. The uh, tan colored line are bees that were collected by bee bowls. These are just colored plastic bowls filled with water and soap that sit there among the foliage. The bees are attracted to those colors they fall in and that's how we sample them. The third line, the orange line, is the combination of both of those added together and the number of species that we found on farms we visited varied from 36 to 54 different species of bees. Who are these major pollinators that are out there? Well, of course, the top left, the honeybee, shows up in all of our fields, and often it's because we have put them there or because there are wild bees of the European honeybee species in the area. But we've also found lots of other bees, and these are the solitary bees or the native pollinators that we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of the presentation. One of the most important pollinators, one of the most important native bees that we have found is a specialist on squash and pumpkin called the squash bee. This one is solitary, so each female produces uh, offspring. There's one generation per year, and what we've discovered is that that female is very active in the morning when the flowers are first open, and then she spends her night down in a hole in the ground where she has nested. Males are also in the flowers, and they hide in the flowers um, in the middle of the day, and that's one way to sample for them is to look at the wilted flowers, and the squash bee will be hiding inside. Adults begin to emerge from their underground burrows in July. They're present for two to three weeks before the female begins to dig and provision a nest with nectar and pollen. Then she lays her eggs, her larvae feed on that pollen, and then they overwinter underground as pre-pupae. It's the females provisioning the nests with pollen from nectar, uh, pollen and nectar from squash and pumpkins that's the benefit to us. The benefit to the bee is that her offspring have that provision as food to grow and develop. Bumblebees, of course, are out there in the fields also. They nest in abandoned burrows or in other cavities in the ground. You can buy commercially produced um, bumblebees if you want to. Bumblebees are generalists. They will visit lots of different flowers uh, around the farm. There's a small group of metallic blue or black bees that are called the mason bees, and these make nests that are sealed shut with mud. Hence, they're, they're like masons. They work with um, a plaster-like material, and that's how they got their name. They do nest uh, in uh, galleries, often in pithy stems or in soda straws. We can make them nest uh, in artificial uh, placements. They are solitary, but they often nest lots of them in one small area. Another important bee that we've discovered is the longhorn bee. It's an all-black fuzzy bee that has very hairy hind legs, great for picking up pollen from moving it from flower to flower. Named the longhorn bees because of the long antennae that are on the female. These also nest in the ground, and one of the most important is a specific longhorn bee called the two-spotted longhorn bee because of the white spots on the side of the body. And then finally, we mentioned sweat bees. There's a, there are three different groups that are called sweat bees, from small to medium, brown or metallic. Some of them are bronzy or golden metallic in color. Most of these are solitary. They will produce several generations per year. They are also nesting in the soil, some of them in soft wood. They're generalists and will visit lots of flowers as well. So you've seen pictures of these solitary bees as we've gone along and talked about the different kinds. Another question is, are they pollinating the crop? We know they're out there. We have seen the bees in the flowers, as you see in these different pictures. Here are some observations from Kentucky in a squash and pumpkin patch where bumblebee, the first bar, and that squash bee, the second bar, and the honeybee, the third bar, and then the black bee that we talked about, the fourth bar, are major pollinators that were collected inside the flowers. 
Here's another bit of data from uh, Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania Farms, where they found bumblebees in 60% of the pumpkin flowers, squash bees in about 30%, and then honeybees in 9%. So these are uh, observations made of the flowers to see which bees are there so that we know they are visiting, they are accomplishing pollination. One more example of the observations from a muskmelon field uh, in Kentucky. Here it's honeybee was the most commonly visited, uh, commonly seen while looking at the flowers, followed by bumblebees, that small black bee, that one called green helictid, that's one of those sweat bees that we were mentioning. So these bees are out there, we know they are doing pollination, we know our crops are getting pollinated because they're growing, they're developing, and they are full of seeds. I'm going to turn the chair and the microphone over to Dr. Jesse to answer the question, can we increase pollination? Hello everyone, adjust the camera down just a tad here. So, you know, as Dr. Don Lewis was saying, there's a lot of different species out there. Um, we know there's a lot of different bee species. So kind of the next question is, is can we increase pollination? Can we use um, flowers and other means to possibly increase the number of pollinators out there pollinating the crop? And one of the ways that we can really increase the number of pollinators there is by increasing the diversity of flowers. So pollinators need pollen and nectar. And so increasing that available pollen and nectar is not only available to the pollinators, but also, although this wasn't part of our research, it's important to keep in mind that the natural enemies, um, lady beetles, you know, very important predators that feed on aphids and other pests, require pollen as a great nu nutrient source. Um, parasitic wasps, you can see the picture there. Um, the larvae are the ones that are inside the aphids or the, the caterpillars, but actually the adult female wasps and male wasps need pollen and nectar to feed on. So these um, increasing the diversity of other um, flowering plants not only benefits pollinators, it also benefits natural enemies, although tonight we're focusing just on the pollinators. So one of the ways in, we call to increase the diversity is called floral resource, resource provisioning, or we tend to shorten it to floral provisioning. And that just basically is kind of a fancy way to say that we're supplementing the landscape with flowering plants to provide um, food for the pollinators. So when I say floral provisioning, just, that just kind of means planting more flowers. And when we consider floral provisioning, there's a num there'll be different lists for the, the different states depending on where you're at, things that will work best, things that will work best on your individual farms and the habitat. But what we're generally looking for is nice showy flowers with good, with good amounts of pollen and nectar, things like bee balm, um, the clover, the Virginia mountain mint, the mints are good, um, the butterfly milkweed, culver's roots, boneset, foxglove, comb flower, New England aster, sweet alyssum. So these are ones that will commonly come up on as good floral provisioning um, species of plants, but go ahead, you know, for your local area, there's plenty of lists out there available and you can certainly chat and ask us about it as well. So we did put these floral provisioning plots in each of the three different states, and this is just some of the data um, looking here in Iowa, um, central Iowa at the horticulture farm, and how many different bee species were observed. And we observed 47 different species, you can see the long list there, and how many of them were observed. And so the most abundant species, again, were the honeybee, um, the squash bee, and bumblebees. So lots of different species, again, kind of what we would expect, similar to what we had seen prior with um, the bee bowl and bee vac experiments. And this is kind of a busy chart here, so I will go through it for you, kind of um, we'll walk through this. So there on the left side, you can see the different bee species. And then on the right side, you can see the, the plants that we are using in the floral provisioning. With all these different um, plants here and some pictures and names. And then here were their crops. So we had our melon, and this was just a melon control, melon that had the floral provisioning, squash control, and squash that we had the floral provisioning. So the, here's our two crop sorts that we're interested in, and then all the different pollinators. So what I want you to observe is that some pollinators, like here this is a bumblebee species, um, the different bumblebee species, they go to lots of different plants. You can see there, there's quite a few went to the coneflower. Um, they really like the culver's root. So that's, you can kind of see the heavy, the width of the bar there says how many times it was observed to go in there. So that's why you see so many honeybees and so many bumblebees because they were so common. And you can also see that the bumblebees really went down um, and fed on the squash as well. And here are the squash bees. So this is the interesting one. This is the one, the squash bee, the species that's very specific just onto our squash pants and not, not melon, just squash. And so you can see the bars going there um, to the squash plants. So I want you to, the kind of the take home from this is that we have lots of different pollinators. We have lots of different flowers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all these pollinators are coming to our squash or our melons. It still is, tends to be a handful of species that are heavily pollinating it, and it's never as simple. You know, it sounds great, just increase the diversity of flowers and you increase um, pollination. That's not, you know, you can't quite make that connection. You increase the diversity of flowers and you can increase the diversity of pollinators, but whether or not that, but that 
at least here, you don't see a ton more different of the different pollinators coming to the squash or the melon. They're still pretty heavily visited by the big ones, the honeybee, the bumblebee, and the squash bee. And I can come back to that one because that one is hard for me to go through. So if anyone wants us to come back at the end and go through that again. And here this figure just kind of shows, um, as we think about floral provisioning, one of the things that's important is to have blooming flowers available kind of throughout the growing season. So even though our crop is only pollinating a certain time of the year, those pollinators need food all the time. And if you want them in the habitat, you have to be, you have flowers there. And so this is kind of to show you a bit that, you know, the, all this is kind of blurry. These are kind of the bumblebees, um, the honeybee. But what you can see in general is that in the beginning of the season, um, May, June, most of the populations are lower, and then as you move through the season, populations tend to build up and you have more workers and more bees out there. So that's kind of nice for our, you know, pumpkin, you know, mid-July and later um, crops that need to be pollinated because there's generally plenty of the native pollinators out there at that time. So when you're considering um, floral provisioning, there's a few things to keep in mind. It's nice to use a local plant source if possible. Remember that you're going to need that bloom all summer, so you want to select several different plant species um, that are going to bloom at different parts of the summer and usually in general we say you know about at least kind of three different species early summer three species midsummer and three species late summer always keep in mind to stick to non-aggressive species you don't want to be fighting your floral provisioning um, plot and you also want to consider a variety of different flower shapes and colors so as you saw in that you know kind of spider web figure you know, the bees like different things and different species of bees like different flowers. So the more variety you have, the more chances you have something that will make your pollinators happy. And it's also nice to have kind of a clump of each type. You don't want just kind of one flower, you know, or one plant of a certain type of flower. It's nice to have, you know, a clump of several different plants or several of the plants there in a clump. So the bees can find it, but they do, it's easier for them to find the, the plant and the flowers they like if there's a larger clump of it. And when you're thinking about establishing this flower area, remember you're going to need an area with full sunlight. Um, most of these flowering plants will do best. So if it's partial shaded, they just won't do as well. And you're also going to need a dedicated area for the plants. And that's the big thing, and it can be a big problem if, you're have, if you have some sort of rotation um, with your uh, muskmelon or squash fields, is this, this plot needs to be kind of a dedicated area because really the perennial plants work best. And the seeds will take longer to establish, but seeds, of course, are much cheaper. But most of these perennial plants, in order to get established, you know, vernalize, have good, you know, root growth, and then flowering, it can take um, two to three years before you're getting really good um, flower production. So it is quite a lot of um, investment as far as time, and then investment as far as a land area that you can keep in flowers, and you're not going to need to rotate into it or need to, you know, move quip equipment around in those areas and things like that. So those are things to keep in mind. The next thing that we can really do to protect um, the pollinators in the habitat, you know, we, we could do the floral provisioning if that works well um, on your farm. But the other thing that we can always in general do is protect those bee nesting sites. And so in order to do that, we kind of need to know where the bees are nesting. And many of them are ground nesters. So a lot of those solitary bees um, that Dr. Lewis talked about in the beginning, they make these kind of tiny little burrows like this. That opening might be the size of a dime or so, and they'll have a little, you know, pile of dirt around it. And that's what the female is going in and out of all day long provisioning on those cells um, with pollen and things like that. You don't tend to see much activity, but you'll see that hole there like that. And each female, most of these species, each female will build her own burrow, but oftentimes we find that the nests are clustered. So although they're not, they're solitary, once they find a nice area, it does, they do tend to have a cluster of nests um, just like this. And they do tend to prefer kind of sandy areas and open areas. The bumblebees um, also can sometimes be in the ground. They tend to prefer like old rodent burrows and things like that, but also leaf litter and compost area. This pictured here is a, just a small bumblebee colony um, that was in a, in a compost. So bumblebees make kind of small colonies. You might get up to 20 or 30 individuals um, by the end of the season. So in order to protect these nesting sites, we really want to avoid tilling fallow areas, especially those open, open sandy ones. And think about the fact that these are going to be there all year long and into the spring because there will be the pupa or pre-pupa in the soil over the winter. It's also nice to leave undisturbed leaf litter or compost. And people are always kind of discovering bumblebee nests and things as they're trying to move compost and they really cannot be moved. We get these phone calls a lot. And unfortunately, it just does not work well to try to pick them up and move those nests. Old tree stumps are great um, nest habitat, and also, you know, just fallow brush piles um, are great bee habitat. So now you can tell everyone that's not your brush pile, it's your bee pile. And the last thing you can really do to protect um, pollinators is reducing that pesticide exposure. Um, foraging bees are exposed to many different insecticides and fungicides, and obviously insecticides kill insects, and bees are insects, so they can really cause lethal or sublethal effects. 
So really what what you can do, use less toxic products when available, and there's um, plenty of information on you know what are what's less toxic to pollinating insects. Use products with a short residual life, and also avoid ta tank mixing with fungicides. There's more information out there showing that fungicides can also have a negative um, impact on pollinators, oftentimes by reducing um, immune response. And sometimes the chemicals, the mix of the fungicide and insecticides can be more toxic than alone. You want to avoid um, the formulations that have you know, very long residual, microencapsulated dust, sweatable powders, and those formulations. And also remember that even the organic insecticides, such as Entrust, can also be harmful to bees. So organic just does not mean that it's not harmful to bees. You want to treat in the evening when the bees are not active. Um, if you've heard before, sometimes we'll say evening, early morning, but in the case of squash bees, they're active very, very early in the morning. So in the case of squash, you, you definitely want to isolate. So the evening is best. Always avoid spraying plants that are in bloom. And remember that bees can be exposed to systemic insecticides applied prior, prior to fl flowering. So the neonicotinoids, primarily the imidacloprid. And you also want to avoid drift onto other flowering plants, weeds, if you've got a floral provisioning plot or nesting areas as best as you can. So kind of the take home from all this is pollinators are really necessary and as we know from the news, they're really facing increasing challenges. Um, floral provisioning and habitat management may help the pollinators, also the natural enemies. Um, so we might get more species and it's definitely beneficial. But kind of the question, will it increase yield, quality, profit? Those benefits are kind of hard to measure and uncertain. Um, the native bees are specialists, they're active at specific times and on specific flowers. We know that the native bees are already present. We also know that small actions um, like you know, protecting nesting habitat and um, reducing pesticide use as best you can, can preserve and protect and increase these benefit, beneficial insects. And also that the biodiversity is essential to the ecosystem. So that's what we have in a nutshell, pretty rapid fire covering of like a lot of different things. So any questions? Okay, here we've got one. Uh, from Cheryl Frank. She's asking, can you show the slide of the flowering plant again? There you go. Ah, there. Is that it, Cheryl? Yes. 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 And the big, one of the important things is plants adapted to your area will work best. And in general, well, and the other entomologists can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've read is in general, three different species early season, three different species mid, and three different species late kind of hedges your bets a bit. And I don't know offhand the flowering times of these. <laughs> but we, we chose them for this um, experiment because the, the blooming year long. Okay, we have a question from Sean now. He wants to study some of the graphs in the presentation. And he's asking where we can find them. Sean, I'll actually be posting a recording of this webinar online. And I will share the URLs to where those will be posted with everybody that has that has been in the sessions and who was invited to these. Otherwise, Laura, is there is there another way that we could possibly share the PowerPoint with people, or is there another site that they can find similar information at? Um, I think for, and I'll speak for the other states, and someone can pipe up, I'm happy to email this presentation. I believe when you're posting it, you're posting all of our contact information as well, and that should include our email. So go ahead and send us an email, and we're happy to, to email it to you as well, if that works better. Any other questions from participants? Celeste is asking, um, if you are to put pollinators under row covers, which ones are best? So we've kind of done a little bit with um, row covers. And if you saw the talk um, last week, um, row covers, especially we've done most of our work with musk melon, but some of the other states have done other crops. It's, it's just kind of like a remake cover over top of the row. And what we kind of looked at is if you could open the ends at the time of flowering or put pollinators under. We did some work with bumblebees just because they're fairly easy you can get a box and you can kind of set the box at the end we did not see increase in yield or fruit production from that over just opening up the row ends but the bumblebees work well that we didn't have problems with overheating or anything like that was which is one of the things we were concerned about I don't know if anyone's tried honeybees but I think you could do something but it's really only bumblebees or honeybees because there's those are really the only two ones that we can put where manipulate and put where we want to other other yeah, Rick, Rick Shelby, you can pipe in too. <laughs> this is Rick here. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, Rick. Yeah, we, we've put uh, Pepinapus, the, the squash bee, under row covers, both with squash and melons. Uh, it's a specialist on squash and pumpkins, uh, but when we put it under row covers and didn't let it access anything else, it actually would pollinate uh, melons underneath there. And the, the only reason why we'd be interested in doing that is in organic systems, 
where we never remove the row cover and uh, uh, can use the row cover as season long insect control and eliminate sprays. Wow, uh, we were they Go ahead. Sorry, were they nesting under there as well then? Yeah, they were. And uh, uh, I haven't seen the results. Uh, my graduate student, Logan Minter, went back the following year to look at emergence um, following some tillage re regimes, and I haven't seen that data yet. He also did a little bit with Melisodes bimaculata, that black uh, longhorn bee with the two spots, and that would also pollinate under a row cover. Uh, basically, with the Pepinapus, uh, early in the season, he would catch the males and females sleeping in the flowers and would just pluck off flowers on some sentinel plants and toss them underneath the row cover. And we found that both the males and the females uh, do a pretty good job pollinating. Hmm. It's really interesting. Um, I have another question here from Cheryl Frank, and I'm having a hard time multitasking, so please forgive me if I ask a question that has already been answered. Um, she says, didn't Dr. Besson discover that the ground nesting bees, especially squash bees, just show up under row covers? <laughs> um. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the only reason why they would show up underneath row covers is if that was an area where you had nests from the previous year. So um, if, if, and it's not necessarily squash or pumpkin fields, they can nest outside the fields. But if you had relatively undisturbed ground that already had the, the nests from the previous season that you covered with the row covers, you could get them emerge underneath the row covers. Uh, they're, they're really not going to, um, dig down and, and tunnel un underneath to get into the row cover though. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Erica. Were there any yield differences in muskmelon or squash with and without floral provisioning? I don't recall okay. any differences. She says yield differences as in number or weight or quality of fruit. I, I can say from Kentucky, we, we did a number of uh, measurements on that. We were measuring we had uh, some six row plots that were either with floral provisioning or without, and we looked at yield, we looked at seed number, and uh, we did not detect any differences between the floral provisioning and the non-floral provisioning. Uh, we're not sure that either of those plots was, were really in a pollinator deficit mode before that, though. Okay. Right. Oh, go ahead. Do you have something else? Yeah, that was similar to Iowa, but again, we were in similar locations, like the horticulture farm that probably didn't have a deficit to start with. Yeah, I'll just chip in from Pennsylvania. Pretty much the same result here in Pennsylvania. We had a hard time seeing a boost in uh, yield or seed number. If you do some uh, complicated statistics, you might be able to pull out slight differences, but overall, not, nothing substantial. Okay, I have another question, unless there's any additions. Okay, uh, Celeste has asked, do squash bees use the same nests for more than one year? No, I believe they do make new nests. As far as we know. What do you think, Rick? I, I, I don't know. I, um, I've never heard of them using the same nest. I have heard of them using the same communal area and a few, there's, there was one person in New York who managed to get a bunch of a bunch of females nesting in, a, in, in one area and they seem to come back to that gen, general area. It was part of a lawn, but she's the only one I know that's ever seen that. And, and I, I would sort of agree with, with uh, Shelby that I think it's, it could be very likely that they would use the same communal area because it, it's not just random places where they put these nests. There, there's probably some characteristics in terms of being well-drained, uh, good uh, sun exposure, uh, not too much uh, 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 plant cover in these locations where they're choosing for nests. And so some of those characteristics may be consistent from year to year and, and increase them using similar areas. I think it's important for everyone listening to realize we, um, we probably don't know that much about the nesting habits of these uh, pollinators. And the wild pollinators in general, we know a lot less than the, than the um, honeybees, and, you know, a little bit more about bumblebees. But um, among the things we do know about them, the nesting information is probably um, of the lowest quality right now in our science. How deep are the nests? Is tillage lethal? Um, so I'm gonna go by information that uh, Dr. James Kane gave me when I asked him that question. He's at the uh, USDA ARS lab in Logan, Utah. Um, of course, it's gonna vary. Uh, I think there's only one or two studies that I'm aware of, and that was in California, and they went down eight, 12, 15, 18 inches. Uh, I read that and I'm thinking like, that's not gonna happen here in Pennsylvania. We're gonna hit rock by that time. Um, and yet we have a lot of squash bees. Um, is tillage lethal? People are still 
struggling with that question. Um, what one one good idea, of course, is if you have some idea of where they're nesting, um, either don't till that area or till it very very shallowly, and uh, that should work. Another possibility is um, if you can delay tillage until um, the feet, the overwintering adults will have emerged, and that'll probably be in in Pennsylvania. That could be into July, so I don't know if that's a possibility. Um, deep tillage, I think, will be lethal. That's that's the best answer I can give right now. Any, anybody else have some ideas? We agree. <laughs> Where we um, went back with um, uh, squash, following squash, um, we, we tilled down to about eight inches and we put row covers over some of those plots and we did have some squash bees emerge uh, from underneath the row covers from about an eight inch tillage. Uh, what we don't know is how many would have emerged if we didn't disturb the soil. Speaking of tillage, um, one thing that some growers here are experimenting with, I, I think of tillage and we've got a lot of no-till, and uh, we have a lot of no-till pumpkins in Pennsylvania, and some growers are experimenting with um, in, their, uh, in, in, their cover, uh, in their cover crop that they're going to use for their no-till, they're putting in some um, crimson clover, um, some hairy vetch, um, and, and they're basically trying to uh, get that it, it, they'll they'll plant it plant that cover crop and then instead of no tilling the entire cover crop and planting their pumpkins into it they'll leave a strip on one side we're trying that this year we're hoping that that'll provide some kind of floral provisioning with the pumpkin crop and it does have the advantage of uh, being close by the pumpkin crop in our settings where these pumpkin crops are you know scattered across the landscape and they move because they they rotate them from different uh, parts of the environment. Okay, um, do we have any more comments on that or to our participants? Um, do you have any more questions? I'll give you a few seconds to submit those still. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions popping up here. Um, we'll go ahead and close out the webinar. Thanks everyone for your time. I guess have a good night and we'll see you again for other webinars. Thanks everyone.